What's up everybody, I'm back with another one of these travel guides. This is from my recent trip to Lofoten Islands in Norway. Amazing landscapes, very Icelandic in a way, as is typical in the Nordic regions. But there's just a lot more hikes, epic views, uh, these amazing vistas, and then the classic locations such as Hamnoy, the town of Rhine, Sacrosoy. So I'm gonna break down logistics, how to get there, places to stay, food, etc. Locations as far as photography and locations as far as uh, the certain hikes I did and a lot of specifics as far as each area, what's the best time to shoot sunrise, sunset, which was actually interesting when I was up there because in the summer, there is actually 24 hours of sunlight. I was there probably late spring and we had about 18 hours of sunlight and then six hours of twilight. It never really got dark. So it wasn't much of a chance for astrophotography, but there was three hours of golden hour at sunrise and sunset. And it gave a lot of opportunity for creative angles and visiting multiple locations every morning and every sunset. So anyways, let's jump right in and let's talk about logistics. So the Lofoten Islands are on the north, not the northernmost point, but it's at the north end of the large country of Norway, which from what I've seen, Norway in itself has many beautiful locations. Lofoten Islands are just sort of popular, I would say at the moment. It's a chain of islands all connected by one main road, little towns here and there, some of the more famous ones, uh, Hamnoy, Rhine, Sacrosoy, but they're actually pretty small as far as towns go. First, I wanna cover some general advice for visiting Lofoten Islands and probably anything that's in the Arctic Circle that time of year. The summer's not really a prime time for photographers to visit due to the fact that you kinda of have daylight, midday daylight throughout the whole day. Um, I believe the sun does dip a little bit on the horizon, so you might get some golden hours. Also, another thing to take in consideration is the locations which way they're facing and the angle at which the sun will be rising or setting. Some of the more famous spots like Hamnoy, it wasn't a prime sunset location due to the fact the sun was rising sort of behind the mountains, behind the location, and it didn't really get hit with that morning light until about at the end of what is considered sunrise, three hours later, two hours later. And then for sunset, there was another large mountain on the other side which obscured the sun uh, right when it was getting to sunset point. So you should definitely do some research depending what time of the year you're going. Use uh, tools like the photographer's ephemeris, uh, Google Earth, and just figure out which way the sun's gonna be hitting certain locations. As far as weather goes, it can be pretty unpredictable. Um, at least that's what I'm told. But of course, everywhere I go, people tell me that the weather can change from one second to the other. They say that here in Miami, they say that pretty much everywhere I've gone, but apparently it's the same out there. They have these things called snow flurries, which is a spontaneous uh, snow cloud, I would guess you would call it, um, that kind of covers an area and it'll just like snow for about 20, 15 minutes and then the sun will come out again. Kind of the same thing we have here in Miami, but the snow version that they have in uh, Lofoten Islands makes for some cool time lapses for sure. I got some of that on my last day there. And then of course, there is the cold to consider. Um, in the summer, apparently it's not very cold as you would expect. In the winter, it gets very cold as you would expect. And when I was there in the spring, it was slightly warmer than it was supposed to be. On my first day there, I actually was wearing a t-shirt and then gradually, as uh, my time there progressed, it got colder and colder. So I think I got lucky in that regards. So as far as arriving to the Lofoten Islands, I personally chose to fly into Oslo. Oslo to one of the larger airports, sort of near the area, Narvik. And from Narvik, I rented a car and drove into the Lofoten Islands. Uh, from what I researched, the rental cars are cheaper if you go to a bigger airport and it gave me a few hours drive time to arrive so I planned accordingly and, and booked some Airbnbs along the way. There are definitely locations to shoot on every different area of the islands. Some other options include flying into Svolvair which is a local airport nearby. Obviously you're going to be flying in from Oslo or one of the other cities that you choose to fly in. Another option that I hear people do is they fly into Bodo which is on the mainland, and then you take a ferry from Bodo to Moskenes, which is actually the city where the campground I stayed mostly at between that and the Airbnbs. As far as transportation goes, it is not totally necessary to have a 4x4 or SUV. The roads are well paved. Another note is that the winter is probably, late winter is probably prime time for photography. I think the recommended window is February or March because you can still see the auroras. There's still a reasonable amount of daylight, although shorter because during the winter there is the opposite of what is in the summer, 24 hours of darkness. There are plenty of Airbnbs. There are actually no hostels, um, at least that I could find. 
but the Airbnbs themselves are run like hostels, which may or may not be a good thing. Um, they'll have like a house in a separate building or separate house kind of built for the purpose. And you're basically sharing the building and all the facilities with the other Airbnb guests. But if you're staying at more hostel type accommodations, you would expect hostel type prices. Everything I found as far as Airbnbs were in the 60 plus range. Of course, they're higher end, higher priced options. And then the famous Eliasin Rorber, I'm not sure I'm saying it correctly, but these red, signature red and yellow cottages that are in most of the towns, the smaller towns, um, such as the ones at Hamnoy, Sacrosoy, and some of the other towns there, you can actually stay at those, but those are, I think, in the $100 to $200 range, if not more, $250 a night. So depending on your budget, how many people you're traveling with, it might make sense, and it might be just for the experience to stay at one of those lodges. I personally go for the budget options, of course, so I stayed at an Airbnb every two days, and then in between, I would stay at the Moscones Camping. Moscones Campground was about 20 bucks, very cheap. They had showers, kitchen, all that good stuff. There is also a law, uh, I believe it's called Every Man's Right or something like that where you are able to camp pretty much anywhere that you can lay a tent um, legally, not like in the United States where you have to camp in specific campgrounds. Regarding places to eat, there's not really much information I can give as far as restaurants and stuff because I personally just went to the supermarket, stocked up on food, I had a little camping stove warmer so I could you know, heat up food actually at the Airbnb that I stayed at. The first couple ones I would batch cook some food and just keep it in a cooler. Between that and sandwiches, I got by pretty fine and didn't really spend that much money at all, which is always a plus for me. Okay, now moving on to the fun stuff. We have the locations. There's going to be hikes that I'm going to talk about and photography locations. So for convenience sake, I'll start in the order that I visited these locations. The first hike I did was called Justa Tinden. Justa Tinden. I'm not sure if it's a soft J. Pretty easy hike. It's about two to three hours. It's next to the town of Vestavagoy. And it being an easy hike, I kind of wanted to ease my way into it. There are obviously some much more difficult hikes that I tackled later in the trip but I didn't want to overwhelm myself on the first one. Just that Tinden has a pretty decent view, nothing too epic like some of the later hikes I did in the trip, but I got some cool drone stuff, a couple of time lapses. The next location I hit was Utaklave Beach. It's uh, famous for this one spot called the Dragon's Eye, which is basically a tide pool with a rock covered in algae. There's a lot of classic compositions if you search Dragon's Eye Utaklave Beach or Dragon's Eye Lofoten Islands. People usually have a shot with the Dragon's Eye facing north, northeast uh, to where the mountain is. But depending on the time of year, it might make more sense like when I was there to do it maybe towards the sun or a little further south. To locate the Dragon's Eye, you walk down to the beach and it's a little bit towards the south end. You might have to walk around a little bit because there's some several tide pools where it seems like people would throw rocks and make their own dragon's eye compositions or maybe they're just trying to throw people off the trail. So Utaklave Beach is a sunset spot, obviously, because it's facing west. Also at Utaklave Beach is uh, the Vegan Hike. As far as difficulty is pretty easy. It is steep, but nothing that's too dangerous or that you might slip. Um, there's a little part there by the waterfall where it's kind of steep and there's kind of loose rocks. It's about one to one and a half hours to climb. There's a few spots as you make your way up where you can get cool shots of the valley. I got a time lapse and a couple photos when I was there. And once you reach the summit, to be honest, it was actually one of the more amazing views as far as the hike to view payoff ratio. It's a very high altitude, so there's definitely some creative angles. It was very cold when I made it to the top. The water in my canteen actually was kind of frozen and it was cold and windy. I tried to do a drone flight, but it was so cold that my phone and the drone were malfunctioning. So I got some cool time lapses and then made my way down before it got too dark and dangerous to make the hike down. Another beach location I visited is called Skag Sandin Beach. I've seen some cool photos that other landscape photographers have taken and on Instagram during more the wintry, snowy months. I personally didn't find anything that I really liked. I got a couple shots using the patterns in the sand facing towards the water. Uh, my time lapse was just okay. There was no clouds on that day, so nothing too crazy. Definitely worth visiting if you're there in the winter because the snow just adds a different dynamic to uh, your compositions and the things you can do. But Skeksenden Beach is a nice little sunset spot to visit and it's right off the road, very convenient, so definitely check that out. One of my favorite hikes was on the third or fourth day there. It was the Wrighton hike. The Wrighton hike is located in the town of Fredvang, which side note, there are these bridges that you take to arrive there. You put the drone up on the Fred Vang side, shoot towards this one pointy mountain, classic composition, and you have the leading line of the bridge 
uh, kind of winding through the shot. The ride and hike is about two hours, moderate difficulty. There are some sketchy spots where there was snow, but depending what time of year, it might be easier or more difficult. You park in this sort of unmarked parking lot next to a house. Uh, there is a lady there who will probably harass you about paying, which is fair because you're using her land as a parking lot. You put money in this little um, mailbox kind of thing and she will definitely remind you if she sees you. You take the trail from the parking lot, it winds up through the hills and gradually gets steeper. As I mentioned, there are snowy sections and you continue up through the mountain. There's a slight deviation where you can make the hike down to Kvalvika Beach. Um, it's actually another starting location for the hike because you can hike up right in from the beach or the parking lot, as I mentioned. You continue upwards and you'll have this epic view of the beach down there and some mountains in the distance. That'll probably be your main angle. There's also this little cliff edge where it's a kind of classic uh, photo that people take hanging off the cliff. And if you angle the shot correctly, you can cut off the little platform that's below you and it makes you seem like you're hanging off this cliff. And I had some other hikers that I met there uh, get a shot of me doing pull-ups because I thought it was kind of funny. And then of course put the drone up, got my cool orbiting shots, some uh, selfie shots. Relatively easy hike, I would recommend to do it for sunset, but definitely recommend it, I enjoyed that hike a lot. Another bonus location in the town of Fred Vang are these uh, curvy horseshoe bend rivers. I'm not really sure what the name is, but I learned about them from a photo vlog guide from Mads Peter Iverson. It's kind of like a sunrise composition, you could probably hit the bridges and the uh, rivers on the same morning, given the three hours of golden hour. But you do a slightly higher angle than you would think because you're trying to get the uh, winding river and you can have the sun in the shot or not. There's not really a lot going on in the background, just some houses and distant mountains. So I would focus the shot more on the rivers themselves. So on to the most famous location, the Lofoten Islands, probably the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the Lofoten Islands, if you know where they are, is the uh, Hamnoi bridge location. So Hamnoi is this small town. I wouldn't even call it a town. It's just a series of houses and those signature Elias and Robert lodges, the red, uh, red variety. There's actually yellow ones in the next town over. But you walk up to the bridge. There's a little parking lot by some fish racks, which are very typical in the region. And there's a fairly high railing. So make sure you have a decent tripod. If you have a clamp, you might be able to clamp your camera for uh, more stability. When I was there, I believe, I went there a few times, there was only a couple of photographers one of the mornings that I went there, but from what I've seen during peak photography season, you know, that February, March window that I told you about, the bridge will be completely lined up with photographers getting the exact same shot because it's such a popular location. You can do a vertical or portrait if you want to include some of the rocks and fit the mountain in there. When I was there, the sun was rising at a interesting angle, like I mentioned. You can also walk down below the bridge. You get down to the water's edge, get a nice low angle, and you can get the shot with the mountain and the signature red lodge. Another cool angle, I got a time lapse there as well. The town right next to Hamnoi is uh, called Sacrosoy, which has the signature, same kind of lodges, but in the yellow color. There's a couple shots to get there. Um, there's this classic small yellow cabin that lines up perfectly with the mountain in the distance. One of those shots that you just get just because it's the thing uh, to do and it's trending. There was another cool shot I got down by the water's edge and the water was so still that the reflection perfectly matched this lodge as the sunset light was hitting it nice and golden and it had another mountain there in the back. I uh, haven't seen that composition anywhere so it might be unique but you walk down by the water's edge and just exploring the area, you'll find some cool stuff to shoot there. Moving even further down south is the town of Rhine. This one is probably what I would consider more of a town, even though it's a collection of houses. It's the biggest town in that area. There is a shot or the main shot that people get is from a viewing platform, wooden viewing platform at the uh, southern end of the town. Depending on how the light hits, you can get a cool sunrise shot there. I didn't have too much luck here. I took some photos, but I didn't like any because as I said, the sun was rising at a very slanted angle and was obscured by the mountains. You might be tempted to fly a drone over the town, but there's a sign posted which lets you know that it's illegal. And it seems like you would be invading uh, the privacy because there's people living there and they don't want noisy drones flying over. I got some cool shots at the other end of town, just going out uh, over the lake to the mountains and then actually turned the drone around and got a shot of the town 
over the water, so I assume that was allowed. Nearby, there is this uh, lake, which was frozen when I was there, but uh, there is a trail. I'm not sure if there's an official hiking trail, but you basically walk up this mountain on the side of the town and you can get a view of the town, which would be facing southeast, I believe. So uh, the sun might be in your shot if it's a sunrise or it'll be on the opposite side if it's sunset, but you get a nice wide angle of town. There's some cool shots you can pick up at the lake. I got some with the cracked ice, using it as a leading line leading up to the mountains. It was actually on an overcast day, so I ended up shooting the photo and editing it as a black and white image because there was nothing really going on as far as lighting. By the town of Rhine, of course, is the most famous hike in the Lofoten Islands, Rhine Bringen. It is definitely one of the toughest hikes in the area. There are some longer, higher altitude hikes, but as far as the hikes that your average person is gonna do, it is the most difficult one, definitely the most difficult one that I've ever done. So you park in the parking lot by the viewing platform where you get the wide shot of Rhine, walk along the road, there's a little sidewalk, side path there. Do not go into the tunnel, you walk past the tunnel and the trail basically begins on the mountainside, probably halfway where the tunnel is. You'll see some uh, arrows painted on the ground. The beginning of the trail is through uh, some swampy, muddy forests, so it's a little bit difficult to find your way and many people have started their own trails. But if you head in a general north direction, you should uh, make your way out of the forest area at which point you'll reach these wooden stones, these uh, steps that have been placed, interestingly enough, by some Tibetan Sherpas that have been hired for the job because, of course, they were very proficient in mountain climbing and all that kind of high altitude stuff. These very heavy stones, I can't even imagine how they lift them and place them. There must be a big team of people, but the stone stairs go up part of the way um, after leaving the forest. I believe the plan is, as of the recording of this video, summer 2019 they're working on it at the moment uh, i think june and july they're working on finishing it to a certain point i don't think it's going to go all the way to the top because once you make it out through the stone area it becomes very steep which is actually the most dangerous part of the hike because when i was there with all the snow and the steepness you felt like you would slide off the edge of the mountain uh, if you didn't have your hands and feet in the proper positions and there isn't really handholds or any like proper way of, of doing it, you just kind of figure it out and try not to die. It's a couple hour hike, but of course a very difficult couple hours. But once you make it up there, the view is amazing. You see the whole town of Rhine, you see the mountains in the distance. I personally went for sunset, though I would recommend probably making a sunrise hike out of it. You know, start when it's relatively light out, but uh, I believe with the sun hitting it on the opposite side, it'll light up the scene better. I shot some time lapses and some cool drone stuff. When I was there, there was a few people making their way up, but it wasn't exactly crowded. Another cool hike worth visiting is uh, called Munkebu Hut, or Munken, I believe. It is a two-part hike. I only did not even the first part, because technically I didn't even make it to the hut, but I did part of that first leg of the hike. You start in the town of Sorvagen, which is south of Rhine, uh, just before the town of A. Yes, there's a town called A, just the letter A with a little circle on it. But uh, you park in this parking lot, buy some mailboxes, pretty easy to find. There's actually two trails, I'm not exactly sure what the name is of the second one, but you make a left instead of a right at one of these two really large waterfalls that there are there, which I didn't find any information or any shots of, surprisingly, because I actually had a lot of fun shooting this waterfall that day and actually did some long expo stuff the next day when it was sort of raining, not really good shooting weather, but yeah, there's this very large, I would say more wide than tall waterfall at the beginning, at the base of the hike. Uh, definitely get some cool shots over there. I got some drone stuff also. And you continue your way up this trail up to a lake, walk around the edge of the lake and continue upwards. And what's cool about this hike and what I enjoyed was that you start down in the town and you go through so many different kinds of terrain. It feels like you've hiked for a long time. It's about three to four hours, so it is a longer hike relatively easy, not nothing too steep. There is one point where you're scrambling up these rocks. So that would probably be the hardest part about it, but you make your way through the lake, some snowy areas, the scrambling rock areas. There's a couple of summits that I hit on the way, got some cool drone stuff, a couple of time lapses. And due to how long I was taking setting up these shots, I never really made it 
to the actual Munkebu hut. So definitely a hike worth making. Uh, like I said, moderate difficulty, three to four hours. I would say sunset or maybe earlier than sunset would be the time to start given it's uh, such a long hike and you don't want to end up hiking in the dark on the way back, which I kind of did. The last main location I visited on my last two days there is the surf beach Unstad. If surfing is your thing and you're comfortable with the cold, definitely worth trying. The waves were actually kind of amazing when I was there uh, as there was an offshore wind and given how cold it is, there's obviously not that many people. Just standing on the beach with the fingertips of my gloves exposed uh, was cold enough for me. Plus I was making my way to the airport on that day so I wouldn't have wanted to get into the water and not have a place to shower or change. That's my excuse, I'm sticking with it. But yeah, it was kind of it was kind of cold to be honest. I got some cool shots there, some drone stuff, some stuff from the beach. Um, I'd say sunset is uh, prime time for this because you have the sun from behind the waves lighting up the surfers. There's a couple angles you can get, one more from the parking lot on the right side, and you can walk down to the left. There's a series of rocks down there in the middle. There's a bakery, coffee houses, and then of course the surf shops where you can rent the gear there. Additionally, on my last day when I was shooting, I pretty much drove around um, the whole northern part of the islands, not exactly where Ryan and all that was, but a little bit northern on my way to the, uh, to the airport, just because everywhere you looked, there's amazing mountains and the clouds on that day were just like doing cool stuff. So I got some awesome close-up time lapses, some wide time lapses. And I was basically pulling off the road every couple minutes just to stop, set up a time lapse and shoot some photos, check out some of these cool close-ups I got of the mountains and really just showcases an example of the photogenic nature of the Lofoten Islands. Overall, I very much enjoyed my 10 days, 600 gigabytes of footage and photos in the Lofoten Islands. Very highly recommended to landscape photographers, anybody who likes that Scandinavian landscape, like Iceland type uh, locations. Visit in the summer if you wanna do more hiking type things, obviously because it's easier to access these trails. More in the winter if you want cool photos and of course the Northern Lights. I might be making a return trip. If I do, it would be in the winter because I don't have any cool Northern Lights photos, but very highly recommended epic landscapes and, and these amazing views from, from these hikes. So that is a wrap for this travel photography tips video. If you have any questions, put it down in the comment section. I'll be putting together a write-up to accompany this video as usual, and I'll link it down in the description. So until next time, see you guys on the next one.